to Bombay, the seaport. And for the first time in my life, I did. It took us almost one month from Bombay to Delhi. Now in August 1927, I reached Delhi, South Africa. the Madrasa Arcade in Durban, South Africa. The curious narrow alleyways of the Madrasa Arcade are familiar to Yaqub Mehtar. Over 50 years ago, he and his young friend, Ahmed, would wander through the marketplace on their way to the tailor shop of Ahmed's father, Hussein Didat. And this is the shop of Mr. Didat, Mr. Didat Senior. Right. Now, here, here was a machine, a, 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 a manual pedal machine. And the machine was here, and all around him used to be material, patched material. So if any customer came and he wanted some patching done, then he would take a piece of material nearest to what the man had, and then he would patch it up, and his fee was about 25 cents. Nine-year-old Ahmed Didat moved to Durban in 1927 to join his father Hussein, who had settled there a few years earlier. Ahmed's voyage to South Africa had been long and difficult. In fact, he almost never made it to the streets of Durban. I nearly never disembarked. The ship was one day late, and the authorities wanted to send us all back. But my father insisted on taking me off the ship. When I got off and rode on a tram, I thought my father owned the tram. I saw my father pay the pay. I thought he was paying the wages of one of his employees. The tiny shop in which his father worked made little revenue. Due to the strict apartheid government, his opportunities were limited since he was not of European descent. But Hussein Didat was not driven by sales. No, he was not interested. But he made it since very soon. At that moment, he didn't have it but his mind that he was to be somebody with a lot of money. No. All he did was uh, made a living out of it. A humble living. And I think he didn't push for him. Whatever you want to do, you know, five minutes. So you sort of don't talk to the soft thing and you really talk to it. My father was a strong man. He loved the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam intensely and did not tolerate any disrespect towards the messenger. My father was not a worldly man. He was only interested in working to the extent necessary to make ends meet. Much of the money went to pay for the rent of their small apartment in Ismail building next to one of the oldest mosques in Durban. One of Ahmed's neighbors in the building, Ahmed Suleiman Balim, would eventually become one of his lifelong supporters. And this is the building, and on the right you see this apartment here, Ahmed Didat and his family stayed. And I used to be his neighbor, next one, which is in apartment number two. And you were very close. So we're very close. Nice people, but the family was very poor people. We didn't have a time to go into his home and spend hours with him. We didn't have, but we used to meet. Ahmed enrolled at the Anjuman school, where he was in standard four. It was the first time he had seen the letters ABC and heard the words yes and no. In six months' time, however, he had learned English and became the top of his class. He was promoted to the next standard, where he also excelled academically. It was not difficult for me to move from India because I was young. 
so I adapted very easily. Every day he walked to school and back home because his father couldn't afford the bus fare of two pennies. He later moved on to Sastri College, a respectable school built by an Indian immigrant to South Africa. Ahmed showed up for the first day of his new school in his clean new uniform, ready to hit the books. But this is where Ahmed Didat's education came to an abrupt end. He must have spent only a few hours walking these corridors because after only three days at college, his father pulled him out. Financial considerations put an abrupt end to him furthering his education. I was not sad when I had to leave college. I had to work when I left college, so it was a matter of survival. My father told me to go to work, and I went to work at Adam's Mission. Adam's Mission was outside Durban in the rolling hills of rural South Africa. Ahmed took a job in a country store called the O.N. Mohammed shop. Just across the way was the enormous Adam's Mission complex an institute where young missionaries learned how to convert others to Christianity. The new Muslim shopkeeper across the road, who knew next to nothing about any religion, became their homework. Almost from the day he arrived, he found the students and the teachers um, attacking Islam and attacking Muslims. It was a daily event for him to hear disparaging remarks, especially remarks like the Qur'an, the Qur'an is false, the Prophet is false, the religion is false, you are destined for hell. He was very easy target at that time, because firstly, he didn't even know much about Islam. All he knew was La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. As soon as they should see this easy meat, they should go for it. And they should hammer the bring down. So they would come to the shop, to do the buying, sugar, salt, flour, rice. And then they would start with us. He says, you know Muhammad had so many wives. I knew nothing about that. He says, you know Muhammad spread his religion with the point of the sword, meaning he threatened people that if you do not accept my religion, I'm going to chop off your head. I knew nothing about that. So he copied his book, the Quran, from the Jews and the Christians. I knew nothing about that. Now this constant attack, what was I to do? We went to Adam's mission to ask the missionaries if there was anyone around who still remembered Ahmed Didat and the shop. Mr. Desmond, the teacher and public relations director at the missionary college there, does remember going to the store often. There's not much left of the store today, but Desmond took us to the site where it used to stand. Yeah, that's where the shop used to be and uh, it was all burned out. I see. Yes. And is this the foundation stone here? Or yeah, that's, 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 that's the foundation. Yeah. Yes, because you know it was wooden iron, so that's why uh, it got bent out completely. Where was the front of the shop? The front of the shop was here, facing this way, facing the college. Yes. And what is that house over there? What? That building here, it, it, it was uh, a building that was uh, uh, owned by Mr. Mohammed himself, or N. Mohammed. We should stay in here, so that's where I could mostly start to have space. Here. Yeah. As a young person, he was agitated and angered by this type of harassment, and he felt uh, an urge and, an, and a desire to respond to them. But he was not equipped to deal with the challenges because he didn't have the background knowledge in, in developing the responses that we required. It was while he was cleaning out the shop where he worked that he stumbled across a book that would change his life. A book which remains in his personal library to this day. This one here, this is the Izharul book, Izharul Haq, the truth is revealed, the original. This is the book. This is the book. Ironically, Izhar al Haq was a religious dialogue between a Christian priest and a Muslim imam. In it, Didat found, for the first time, a response to the Christian allegations posed to him. Book by book, page by page, his mind began filling with dates, names, facts and quotes. But not only was he learning about his own religion, he found one book in particular very interesting, the Bible. 
This is Mr. Didad's very first notebook. The very first ever notebook of his research. The Bible verses there, cut out, he cut out Bible verses and he stuck them along. These are his hard work research in the fortune. He knew the Bible more than even the Quran. He studied the Bible and he put quotes at random at any time, at his least. The type of uh, format that my father had when he read books, History of the Jews by Paul Goodman. When he reads books, as soon as he has read them, he makes notes, specific notes. Jews hail Muslims. Conquest, page 71. So it's easy reference. And he marks them. Look at that. Islam. He marks every book. So all this is the University of Sheikh Ahmed. No schooling. This is where he went to school. This is his school. You're looking at the University of Sheikh Ahmed Gidan. And I call this the University of Hard Knocks. Where you have to knock your head and read and read and read and no end of reading. Ahmed Gidan now had his armor. His shield would be his extensive knowledge of the Bible and Quran, and his sword would be his frank, piercing style of delivery. In 1940, he took to the stage and began giving lectures to small audiences, first of which was Muhammad, the Messenger of Peace. His friends helped him secretly put up posters at night, since it was illegal to hang posters advertising such a talk. The greatest and the first moment of my life in the pile started about Ahmad Didad when I was a boy of 12 when he gave his first lecture in a cinema known as Avalon in the year 1939 or 40. His wife Hawa was at first shocked to see her husband doing so well up on the stage. I thought can this man talk? <laughs> then of course the audience was small sometimes ten people just because he was just then he was just coming up, you know. But his talks gained in popularity until eventually he found himself here at the town hall in Durban. He now had a full house of around two thousand people. Didat's lectures here were some of the few events in which segregation briefly disappeared. His message was that there were many contradictions in the Christian Bible and doctrine, and that Muhammad was indeed a noble messenger sent by God. Half a century later, the seats are empty and the great hall is nearly silent. All that remains is the sound of the antique grand piano getting a tune up. This piano too was a quiet spectator at many of Ahmed Didat's lectures here. But it must have long forgotten the scores of those angry listeners who stood up to challenge him, as well as the numerous conversions which occurred after his talks. How many times is Mary, the mother of Jesus, mentioned in your Bible? I said, the Christian. I want a Christian to answer that, please. Uh, I want to ask you a question. No, no. Why are you mentioning a monitor in this, uh, in this mission? Dear brother, simple question, simple. No, I was not trying to score any point. I said, how many times is Mary, the mother of God, your mother of God, how many times is she mentioned in your book? But the footsteps of that first night can still be heard by those who listen hard enough. Once a shy young businessman fresh from Gujarat Suleiman Sheikhji can still remember the exact spot where he sat over half his lifetime ago. So I didn't see you were lying. For him, Didat is still on the stage, his distinctive arms flying about, his booming voice echoing throughout the auditorium. He can still feel the excitement of the crowd and the tension in the air. It's been a long time, hasn't it? Very long. Over 40 years. And you'd be seated here? Yes. Yeah. What would Ahmed did that talk about? About the prophet Muhammad. He talked about Jesus. Muhammad in Islam. What the Bible say about Christians. What was he like as a speaker? 
You speak very well. Simple language. All understand. In a small bit, children used to come there to that person. What was their response? What did they think of that person that? Did they like him? Did they hate him? No, we all liked him. A few of them said, hated Some priests in Missouri said to hate him. We attended uh, not so much for the uh, benefit we would have got out of the talk. Not so much for that, or not so much to learn. We were young people in our early 20s, and he was, uh, I won't say hating back at the Christians, but he was debating and putting our point across to them, and he was like, like when you go to a box match and you got your hero hitting the opposite side. That was more than, than anything else. Not so much to learn. My early talks were very successful. Very successful, and I expected them to be a hit because I was rising, raising a hot topic. So I anticipated a strong turnout. Oh, Papa, I'm a chicken. You used to lecture in the house a lot, and I used to complain, you're making a lot of noise. You're a very noisy man. <laughs> I was very, very proud of him. Every lecture, every way, wherever we said that was gone, I was always present. But he was supporting me in his uh, work. And we always tell that you go ahead. Whatever you want to go, and we'll push you, and we'll help you in whatever manner we can. We'll support you all the way. But not everyone was so supportive. Some Christians and Hindus felt his sarcastic comments were disrespectful. They were also frustrated because the evidence he gave was from their own holy books. Many Muslims in Durban felt he was too aggressive in his talks. Organized missionary work was not common in the Muslim world. It was the many Muslims, Indian Muslims of Durban, who objected to Ahmad Didat that we should not discuss any religion or anything and bring the friction between the Christian and the Muslim. They even asked Ahmad Didat that, Ahmad, stop this. Let's not be bring enemies. Please don't go on the platform. And we, as we had Mr. A.I. Kadi and uh, many other Muslims told him, we will go and tell them that you are young and your blood is hot and you just got onto the stage to say something, but you found it, you cannot do it, so please step down. But Ahmed did that. He says, no, I will do what I want to do. I don't think at that particular time the Molalas hated him and disliked him because he didn't cross swords with him. The Molalas were not opposed to me, but they were indifferent to my people. They may have been afraid to support someone who was challenging the religion of those who ruled the country at the time. I did not feel threatened by the government, although the special branch visited me and they told me, you are the most dangerous man in South Africa and there is nothing we can do about it. Eventually, some Muslims became impressed with him and changed their views after they saw Christians and Hindus converting to Islam. He spoke, I would not remember much, but I believe that two Christian priests and three or four Europeans embraced Islam at his lecture. And those who objected to him, like A.I. Kaji and Kaji Musa, and many of them came and shook hands with Ahmad Didat and said, Ahmad, we didn't expect this greatness out of you. But many were to remain opposed to his potent missionary tactics, and some of his strongest opponents were of his own flesh and blood, including his own brother, Abdullah. But Ahmed was devoted to spreading Islam in the best way he knew how, by speaking. He looked forward to the question and answer sessions at the end of his lectures, in which Christians would line up with their Bibles in hand, ready to refute his points. But no question was too difficult for him. 
he could silence his challenges by quoting the Bible from memory. Meanwhile, Ahmed Didat was working to support his family as well as his preaching. I met Ahmed Didat in 1945. Uh, when, I was, when I was given employment by uh, a firm called Simplex Furniture Factory. The building of the Simplex Furniture Factory where Ahmed Didat worked is now a Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurant. Now this building uh, was originally a big warehouse in which there was a furniture showroom. Ahmed Didat's desk was here. Yeah, he used to sit down there, organize his dispatch. And this is where Ahmed Didat worked? Ahmed Didat, as a young man, worked here as a dispatch clerk for the Simplex Furniture Factory, which was the name of the business at the time. So there wasn't a wall here at that time? There was no wall. There was only a door here. Now, whatever goods were sold and to be delivered, he to come out of this door, and at lunchtime, he would lock up the door, open again at 2 o'clock, and 5 o'clock, close and take the key home. So he was solely responsible for the door. Now, he was given this uh, responsibility because he was an honest man. And his boss, our boss, because I was also working for him, realized that with him putting the door key, there will be no filthy. Ahmed even found opportunities at the furniture factory to give his spiel on comparative religion. He had an African worker with him, a very nice, humble fellow, and he that somehow liked him. He could take him to his house, to do the odd job. You know, like how we could make use of these people. They work for a firm, and you take them and do your private work. But his name was Dadan Bing. That was his name. And he was a very nice fellow, humble fellow. So Dida took a liking to him. And he became Dida's first guinea pig. So he started working on him. The Dan Bengu. And he converted him. Ahmed's preaching began to take over his life. He moved to apartment number 45, Hussein Building, where he put in countless hours of planning as well as budgeting. My father spent his own money and he printed cards talking about Islam to the Zulu people, to the black people, and you would see clearly here his home address, 45 Hussein's Building, Keen Street, and his home phone number. And he began to do this on his own distribute cards with his own money. Many times they didn't have enough money to pay rent for their flat, the home that they were living in. It was a great struggle, a struggle throughout. And you know, his wife used to make sheep meat himself during the Eid al-Adha. He used to have sheep and goat that he used to sell to his mental challenge. He was a super salesman. He could have been earning a lot of money. He gave that up. We're right outside of the house where Ahmed Didat used to live. The reason I'm trying to be quiet is because the current occupants have asked us to keep the noise down. You see, there's someone inside who isn't feeling very well, has just had a stroke. We might try and make our way in in a minute and take a look inside if possible. But it's interesting to know that this house is very close to the mosque right across the road in Durban. That's the mosque where Ahmed Didat used to take visitors for a little tour and it was strategically positioned because he used to invite people to come to his home, have a meal, have some samosas, and explain to them what Islam is, and then tell them, you know, there's a mosque just across the road. Would you like to come take a, a look at the mosque? And that was part of the core strategy, the core Dawa strategy of Ahmed Didat in the early days. The front door is as far as we got. It was obvious that this was not luxury housing. He must have lived humbly to save money for his preaching. And although money was tight, he still tried to make his family a priority. Whenever I'd see something I liked, Mr. Didat would buy it for me. I didn't even have to ask. All I would say is, that's nice, and he would get it. Meanwhile, his popularity was growing nationwide. He was invited to Cape Town, where he received an overwhelming response. 
As a boy growing up in Cape Town, Ibrahim Saleh Mohammed not only attended Ahmed's lectures, he also helped to promote them. I know this road so well. You know, in the past, we used to, when Chesky left us to come to Cape Town, we used to come down this road and post posters all over the show. Um, sometimes illegally, but in those years, there weren't any uh, clauses in the government to say that we couldn't do it. And that was one of the areas that gained in popularity was the fact that his poster was all of the show and everybody wanted to meet this man and see who he is. Ibrahim's father, Saleh, who was then the owner of the Rosmead supermarket, befriended Ahmed late one night when he came to the shop needing a favor. Sheikh Ahmed had a talk at uh, one of the mosques and the lecture ended quite late and he normally stayed with the Sayyid and when he returned to the Sayyid's residence that night, the place had been locked up and he couldn't get the Sayyid's away. And the person that took him to the Sayyid's house said, well, they know somebody that would still be awake at that time of the morning, you know, referring to my dad. And when they went, they came around to the small store that they had, my dad was busy back in foot in bed. And I well, offered him a place to sleep for the night and he, been, well, he, he slept with us whenever they came to the country. The two men would go on to become close friends. Saleh would reserve the halls for Ahmed to speak in when he came to town. In Cape Town, he lectured in huge lecture halls, including the Good Hope Center and City Hall. But his lectures there had more than just religious significance. Many of the Muslims of the Cape had been brought over from Indonesia, Malaysia and India as slaves and political prisoners. They felt downtrodden and were tired of life as second-class citizens. To them, Ahmed Didat was a knight in shining armor who had come to liberate them from the pressures of hardline missionaries and the idea that Islam was not a credible religion. I think because of the condition that the people found themselves in, uh, they were subjected. I mean, most of the people lived below the bread line. And the Christians offered something to them. They offered them food and money and they would um, they would change the religion to this and Sheikh Ahmed that offered them something that they could counter um, with this. The Western arrogance made you feel uh, a lesser human being together with the apartheid ideas you were not equal to the white man and your faith was therefore suspect or part of an uncivilized. And so Sheikh Ahmad going there and, 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 and having these debates and presenting Islam as a positive force and dealing a hefty blow to the Christian missionary aggression, right, raised the morale of the Muslims. And in his gatherings in the Cape, 30, 40,000 people used to turn up. But along with his momentum came the demand for a professional organization which could manage the size of planning and the money he needed to continue. And so in 1957, Ahmed Didat, alongside two of his closest friends, founded the Islamic Propagation Center in Durban. The organization's first base was a tiny one-room office in the Madrasa Arcade. The room still exists today, but has become a bookshop. The three founders started recruiting staff one of whom was a secretary by the name of Muhammad Khan. They said, join us, join us, Mr. Wenger, and Mr. Dijah said, they wanted to type this. I'm a such type yes. So, he said, I come and join me. I did so much books and all, so come and join me. You need to see that. I said, I can't, I must wind up here again. Give me a month's chance to close up the business and hand it over. So I handed over and I came and joined them in 1959. In its early years, the IPC was involved in printing books and organizing classes for new Muslim converts. They would go door to door collecting money for their activities. Ahmed developed a good rapport with his staff, although he had a reputation for being demanding. A stern man who wants a job done must be done. That's how it works. You can't pull around. You want to do a thing, you must do it. Then after. 
Then one night in 1958, after a lecture in a mosque, Ahmed was given an offer he simply couldn't refuse. A man by the name of Haji Kadwa approached him and offered to donate 75 acres of land on the south coast for the sake of Islamic propagation. It sounded too good to be true. His lifelong dream of establishing an Islamic version of Adam's mission had just fallen out of the sky. And so a Salam was born as a Muslim seminary where students would learn about comparative religion and how to pass on the teachings of Islam. Ahmed and his family uprooted from Durban and moved 80 kilometers south to the uninhabited hills surrounding a Salam. He had to chop down trees just to reach the land. Once he arrived, he immediately put his hand to the plow in establishing the institution. He was the builder, the carpenter, the plumber, the one that brought the water from the dam, established the dam and brought the water from the river. He made the roads. So almost all his time, because the resources were so limited, almost all his time went into building the structure. And as you know, he remained there for 17 years. But in that 17 years, we were starved of funds. So the little money that came in was used to build the structure. Students enrolled and classes began. As Salam was at last up and running, both he and his wife continued to work in the fields as well as in the classroom. And so with his house built on site and with the mosque and school already built, the stage seemed set for Ahmed Zat to achieve his dream of a Muslim Da'i college. And yet that dream was to turn out very differently from how Sheikh Zidat envisaged. The development of As-Salam is indeed a milestone. It was the idea of one person who was perhaps too far ahead of his time. He was in many ways a pioneer in his ideas, but the community around him were not quite ready to establish such a vast institute. After 17 long years and despite Ahmed's best efforts, a Salam was failing. The lack of funding and expertise was proving to be too much. In 1973, he finally asked the trustees to relieve him of a Salam. And so, without ever realizing his dream, Didat returned to Durban and the Salam was made into a private Islamic school. I was relieved when I left As Salam because I wanted to focus more on the ITC. As Salam did not let me focus enough on Dawa internationally. He set his hopes for just that an international audience. His first opportunity to go abroad came sooner rather than later. On a trip to the World Association of Muslim Youth Conference in Riyadh in 1976, Ibrahim Jadwat took Ahmed along for some exposure. When I asked the, the Saudi television people to uh, interview him, uh, you know, they laughed at me saying that they are 50 or 60 great scholars from all over the world. And why should we interview him? And so I said, look, give him two minutes of your time and I'm sure that you will find something interesting. So they gave him, they humored me, and they gave him the opportunity to come on TV. And of course, the next day they were there because he was interested with his approach, his dynamism, his personality, and the, and the ideas that he presented was an instant hit. So they came back every day for more and more, and, and that's how he was open, opened up to the Muslim world. The Arab world was swept off its feet. They were thrilled by his knowledge of Christianity and his entertaining speeches. Then. Uh you didn't, uh, you don't have any degree, scientific degree, or you didn't graduate from university? No, I didn't have that good fortune. I passed a very primary stage in education, what we in my country call standard six, that is four years before metric. Yeah. I finished off. And how could you be like that? So much knowledgeable. <laughs> you see, I suppose it's experience. You know, it has been a hobby with me, but this was actually forced by the Christians of Hindu. The money he got, the money got, I might be. The first trip to Riyadh was a major event in his life. 
the, in the letter that he wrote to the then Secretary General of Islamic Banker, in which he says that coming to this conference uh, will make, I can feel that one of my dreams of printing and distributing the Quran and the literature in the volumes that we require will be realized by the people that I'm meeting and the opportunities that I am now uh, presented with. Going to Riyadh was a turning point for me. Not because it opened up the East, but Riyadh o opened up the West. July of 1985, he agreed to a debate in the Royal Albert Hall in London with an American missionary, Professor Floyd Clark. The topic was the crucifixion of Jesus. He had fine-tuned the art of debating with them on issues that were critical. And all he was saying is that you have declared a war on, on me and my faith, and I'm obliged to respond. And the only way that I can respond is by questioning the things that you are questioning me about. For example, if you said that my Quran is false, is the Bible the word of God? More than 50% of the bishop, paid servant of the Anglican Church. They are telling their congregation, Jesus, you don't have to believe. If you don't have to believe, join hands with us. That's what we're trying to tell you for 1400 years. We were telling you like a kafar. So the first opportunity came up at Albert Hall, and it was opportune because it was also in the summer, and a lot of Muslims from different parts of the world were coming for their holidays uh, to London at the time. And so it was an instant hit uh, this is the teaching of scripture that Jesus was resurrected and Jesus was alive. <laughs> With regards to the, the word risen or resurrected in the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, not once is the word resurrection used in connection with Jesus that he is resurrected, not once. So once that Albert Hall event took place, then it was like the floodgate opening up Salahuddin with his, you know, uh, raising his flag of Islam in the capitals of the Western world, giving the arrogant white man a big slap in the face. After London, he was swept up in a whirlwind of tours. Morocco, Sweden, Kenya, Australia and Denmark. The world was too small a stage for him. And with nearly every debate, he had made more fans and more foes. Mr. Ahmed Dida challenged me and he did it clearly, openly, without hesitating that he had come as a guest to Sweden. He even insulted me with a smile in his face. You see, I have been, the, the, the pastor will say, challenging. But I say I'm appealing to my Christian brothers, learned people, in my meetings all over the world, when I have a chance, I said, brothers, sisters, I would like you to do me a favor. If Jesus is God, I would like you to show me one verse, only one statement, anywhere in your Bible, any version of the Bible where Jesus says, I am God, or where he says, worship me. He was so anxious to meet their best, because the best was too small for him. If you remember, get the tape and you see, he mistranslated, for which he has not apologized yet. And then at last, the person who was finally on his level agreed to a match. My most memorable thought was the debate with the giant Jimmy Stagger of the USA. What man can must have is a change of heart. The American Reverend Jimmy Swaggart was the head of a $100 million ministry and his sermons were televised in over 30 countries. The topic of the swaggart Didat debate was, is the Bible the word of God? 8,000 people showed up ready to watch what would become known as the Great Debate. The debate that took place really was, in many ways, the culmination of Ahmad Didat's lifelong mission to challenge those that had declared war on Islam, those that were denigrating Islam. And so he was vindicated 
what was amazing was the level of which he was able to refute the argument and to present the, the argument. My brother, look, he had 10 minutes. He had enough, more than enough time to read that, that little chapter of Ezekiel. I said, I dare anybody to read it to his congregation. And I tell you, I dare you, you will not read it. Reason? Because it is not the word of God. If it was the word of God, you would not be ashamed of it. If God Almighty was not ashamed to reveal the details of the whoredoms of those two sisters, I am asking why should you be ashamed? Are you holier than God? Along with his prominence came more financial support. He was now able to open new doors. He moved the IPC to a much larger building. It soon became the IPCI, or Islamic Propagation Center International. This is his chest, this is the chest that is to sit, and that on this side is his personal secretary that is to sit there and take all notes for him. And on this side, he had, uh, if he had more than two or three people, he would make them sit here. I was just a, a protracted discussion, something more intense, then he used to make them sit here. It was in this office that Ahmed Didat received all types of people. Some were timid and others were fuming. Some came saying they had to deliver a personal message from God. Let me tell you what the God of above, the one I adore and I love, Allah be his name, be praised, has asked me to come and invite you right. to a very special function of right. a mixture of Jews, Christians and Muslims. Right. Right, 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 right. It's going to be an unusual celebration in the sense right. that it is a party and we're going to have tea and cake first right. and then after the tea and cake we're going to have some dancing. Right. But the message could sometimes turn into trauma. It must have been one of the few times in Ahmed Didat's life when he was nearly speechless. I'm tired of the party. I can't enough. Right. Here we are so near and dead so far. I can't enough. Most people, the Jews and the Muslims. I know, so like, close. like brothers, and they keep fighting. And I can't handle it anymore in my life because I've been torn between them. Right. wherever I go right. and I told the Lord I've had enough please don't do it to me anymore I love Allah but I love God and Jehovah to the Jews one of the most memorable visitors here was the head of a Catholic church body Mr. Dawood Nguane to what do I owe I, this honor of your visit well I wanted first of all to see you. Right. you know, I was very much he entered the office abruptly one day after discovering one of Ahmed Didat's publications in his home. Look, I, it happened by, by coincidence because I was looking for a particular book in my son's bedroom. There's a pile of old books in my son's bedroom. I was looking for a book that I wanted to use. And um, <clears throat> while looking for this little this book, I found this little book. And the, 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 uh, the title attracted my attention. Crucifixion or crucifixion? I thought, what, is, what does it mean? So that day, I read the booklet three times. I tell you that I couldn't put the book down during my supper time. I had the book in my hand when I was, when I was eating. I couldn't put it down. I saw this man's name at the end, his address, and I thought, let me go and see this man. At first, they wouldn't let me see him, because when I came, they said, do you have an appointment? I said, no, I have no appointment. I said, no, you can't see him. I said, no, I must see him. The receptionist in front then telephoned him, and he said, there's a man he insists on seeing. And he said, send him in. You know, I was very much interested in what you wrote. Right. Right. I, I like what you wrote and it makes sense. Right. It makes a lot of sense. Right. I'm a Christian. And I put the book <laughs> I said, what do you mean? What do you mean she tried to read the He said, you read that book? I said, yes, I read the book. He said, didn't you find out why I say he wasn't crucified? I said, I don't believe you. But then if Jesus said, I'm going to, to die and rise, right. Even, even though they did not see him, right. then how can we say it did not happen? Right. So now, we say now we have to now, we have to find out what did he mean? He said, you fool! 
You are a Zulu? I said, yes, I'm a Zulu. He said, your forefathers believed in one God, Mvelinang, and today you believe in three gods. That day, Mr. Nguani's world was turned upside down. In the following year, the words replayed in his mind as he carried on with his Christian life. But a seed had been planted, and he found himself back in Ahmedidat's office again and again. Back and forth, and he would give me literature, I would read the literature and come back with questions. And I tell you, uh, he would answer my question. I would come through that door thinking, today I'm going, I'm going to get him. He would just laugh at me. Dawood eventually realized his beliefs had changed. He resigned as head of the family life committee at his church. At the age of 63, he began a new life as a Muslim. But he was never able to have another conversation with Ahmed Didat at the IPCI. Because on May the 3rd, 1996, Ahmed Didat's life was changed drastically. The vibrant, dynamic orator was violently catapulted into a body which no longer worked. He suffered a stroke which left him completely paralyzed from the neck down. And six years ago, he suffered a stroke which is known as the Locking Syndrome. Locking Syndrome is that a father can hear, understand, feel everything. But it is difficult for him to communicate very well. He can communicate with others as well by coordinating his eye movements with an alphabetical chart. I called out the rows individually, and my father, with the blinking of the eye, watches the face. Give me a yes, Papa. That's a yes. Give me a no. It's no. If a man can tell you yes or no, and if you give him leading questions, Surely he can speak. And speak he does. Right. He indicates the moment our camera crew arrived right. that he wanted to give us a message. He said right now at 3.30 on the 17th of September 2002 and I read I am happy to see my brother from Dubai. We weren't the only visitors on that day. A local acquaintance, Mr. Ayu, dropped by to talk about his recent publications. In that meeting, Ahmed spelled out a blunt message to his friend. It became obvious that Ahmed Didad's sharp wit and sense of humor hadn't gone anywhere. Christian missionaries are still trying to convert Ahmed Didat. We come sincerely. We had a lady, the African lady, who visited my father on the 25th of December 2001. 25th of December. She came in with the Bible. And she said, accept Jesus as a Savior and you walk. Muhammad is dead. On the 25th of December, Mr. Dida immediately responded to the attack. Immediately. And I read to you, at 1300 hours, Mr. Dida says, Dear Msomi, ask your friends to be seated. First and foremost, the Sunnah of Rasulullah, Ahlan wa Sahlan. Ask your friends. Immediately thereafter, we requested that. Please read Genesis chapter 19, verse 30. In other words, if you want me to accept this book as the word of God, which you have, please read for me Genesis chapter 19, verse 30, which is the first book of the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 19, verse 30. And she is there. And Alhamdulillah, she never came back. It is the story of Hazrat Lut al Salaam. It is the story of Hazrat Lut al The elder daughter said, Our father is old, and we have a man to come. 
come, let us drink in his wine, that we may lie with him. The first daughter, the eldest daughter, with the father to point, and he said to him. And the next night, he told the younger one, Come, you make your father drink wine tonight, and you lie with him. And the Bible ends up in saying, Thus, both the daughters of Lot, the child by their father, that incest, they were not punished. If you are not punished, you do something wrong in a punishment. To this day, my father is defending his life. One of his most memorable visits was when a familiar face showed up and greeted him, this time as a Muslim. When I decided that I'm going to become a Muslim, I woke up, up in the morning and I told my wife that I'm going to convert to the truth. I'm a Muslim. And I went to the IPCR mm -hmm. to go and see you, to tell you. I thought I was going to break the good news to you. And on that day, when I came at the IPCI, they told me, you know, you, you were sick and you are paralyzed. On that day. Today, they watched the video of that first day when Dawood walked into Ahmed's office demanding answers. It's strange for both of them to look back on that day now. Each man lived a completely different life back then. While the peaks in his life appear to be over, Ahmed still looks forward to the day when he is able to move and speak again. He says the first thing he'll do is tour the Arab world once again. In the meantime, his legacy is already moving in the lives of others. And the IPCI is busy keeping pace with public requests. It receives scores of phone calls, letters, emails and faxes each day. We are so well known here that even if the people don't write our address, they just write Sheikh Ahmadiz at Durban or IPCI Durban, it has to reach us. The IPCI is currently in debt and internal politics have hindered the organization in recent years. But the IPCI continues to promote and preserve his message. We are training a crop of that. And, and so the, the Alhamdulillah Sheikh Zidat has left us the information and he has done the greatest groundwork anyone could do. For instance, you get a brother from America for a person in New York to write to you and say, look, I watched one of Sheikh Zidat's tapes and I've declared the Shahada. Here's a few dollars from you and please send me more literature. So while Sheikh Zidat may be lying in bed and while we're sitting in this office here, he is still transforming and changing people out there. It's 6 p.m and the IPCI's new Muslim class is just winding down for the day. Ibrahim Tembu, who once exercised demons in Look at the background of the IPCI first. The Islamic Propagation Center International in Durban, South Africa, was established over 35 years ago by Sheikh Ahmad Didat. It has been on the leading edge of Dawah through its dynamic activities. Its activities under the leadership of its president, Sheikh Ahmad Didat, includes the printing and distribution of the Holy Quran and free Islamic literature, the distribution of audio and videotapes, and the conducting of tours to the mosque. Sheikh Didat, at 74 years of age, is still waging a relentless mission for Islam and has delivered thousands of lectures all over the world. Nice, beautiful epitaphs on his tombstone. He has participated in many debates. What then shall I do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? And my first point is that I want to explain how the Bible came into existence. He has participated in many seminars and has held meaningful discussions with a wide group of people articulating the beauty and truth of Islam. They wanted to become more westernized, more European. And Mr. Is there any way I can be of any help to you, sir? In any way? 
Yes. I'm going to visit at the west and at the east province. Right, and right. And at the south and the south and the south and the Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Sir. Pleasure, pleasure. It was a pleasure and a privilege. I thought somebody was pulling my leg when they said <laughs> the President Mandela on the line. I thought somebody is making a fool of me now. <laughs> thank you very much. May God bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Bye bye. Bye. Alhamdulillah, the center to date under the guidance of Ahmad Dida has been able to distribute well over 300,000 holy Qurans millions of books and leaflets and several thousand audio and video cassettes. Thousands of non-Muslims have embraced Islam as a result of these initiatives. Now we want to publish 100,000 of the Qurans. This outstanding work has been made possible by the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the generosity of Ahmadidat's many well-wishers all over the world. Unfortunately, as Providence would have it, on the 3rd of May 1996, Sheikh Ahmad Didat was struck by stroke whilst on duty and became incapacitated, being unable to move any limbs, unable to speak and un unable to eat. However, Providence in its mercy retained Sheikh Didat's hearing, eyesight and ever sharp and alert mind. Sheikh Didat communicates with a unique combination of eye movements identifying the English alphabets. For the past six years or so, Sheikh Didat is not confined to his bed in Verlum, but still influencing and changing the hearts of people all over the world with the legacy of his books, videotapes and infrastructure that he left behind at the IPCI. Despite his handicap, Sheikh Didat has dedicated and dictated many books from his bed via the eye communication method. However, it can be said with humility that no other South African or perhaps no other sick person has had so many visitors from all over the world, ranging from government ministers, TV crews, from major international networks, religious leaders of all religious groups, academics, scholars, and ordinary people. In this snippet, we see Minister Louis Farah Khan from America paying a visit to Sheikh Ahmadidat at his home with his entourage on his recent visit to South Africa. And last time, I had the privilege of going to meet one of my heroes. Who is that? Ahmed Didat, one of the great champions of Islam. He's a hero of mine. We have shared many days together. He visited me in my home in Chicago, Illinois, and I visited him here and saw him in the days of his strength. And last night, I saw him even stronger. His brain is sharp. He can see, he can hear, he can think, he just can't speak. But his faith is so strong. I came from his bedside so inspired, so uplifted. And I said, Father, when I go back, I will carry on your great work. Do not worry. You will never be Forgotten. The master of the Supreme Court appointed new trustees to the IPCI Trust, and so the current trustees of IPCI are Mr. Ahmed Said Mullah, who is the Amir, Mr. Tahir Sitoto, 
and academic at Natal University, Mr. Yusuf Ali, Dr. Khatija Moloy, who is an academic at Rao uh, uh, University, Mr. Ibrahim Jadwit, Mr. Daud Ngwane, the attorney, Dr. Muhammad Khan, Mr. Harun Kala, Mr. Akhtar Token, and Mr. Anwar Bellum. Direct, the director of the IPCI is Mr. Rafik Hassan. The new trustees over the past six years have indeed kept the legacy of its founder, Sheikh Ahmad Didat, alive and have also unanimously voted him as patron of IPCI for life. However, many sweeping changes, politically and otherwise, have taken place both in South Africa and globally, changes that brought into play new scenarios and new demographics. The IPCI had to meet these new challenges. One of its intervention measures was to bring in international guest speakers. Over the past few years, the IPCI brought the following dynamic personalities to our shores. Dr. Ali Musa from America, a previous drug lord turned social reformer. Dr. Khalid Al-Mansur, an academic from America. Dr. Deborah Mubashir, a former Baptist minister from America. Mr. John Yahya Kaysen, also from America, father of the boxer Hasim Rahman. Our current MC, Dr. Don Matera, is our own international personality in his own right, who ran a workshop on African Renaissance. Then came September 11th, which changed again in a very profound way the world we live in. To meet these challenges, we had as guests of IPCI, Dr. Zafar Bangash of Canada, and Dr. Enver Masood from Washington, D.C., who gave us some insight into the happenings of September 11th. The IPCI also has embarked on making available relevant books to counteract the false propaganda and at times blatant lies that are being splashed on our print and electronic media. Dr. Allah, 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 Allah. One of the core programs of the IPCI is what we call human resource development, training of individuals to meet the challenges and the new challenges facing us globally, nationally and internationally. Here we see a, the last July group of students from all over the country who have come in for a one week intensive training program that was run at As Salam Institute. These are uh, the du'at from all over the country, some of us far afield as Botswana, Lesotho, Zambia, and the nine provinces. IPC also concentrates on development of the women who are the first universities of society. Ahmed Didat, ya muassis al qawi, Ahmed Didat. The mission statement of the IPCI reads to present the message of Islam in a manner that makes Islam a blessing to humanity. We call upon all to pray for us and help us to achieve our mission and make our country a prosperous place to live in and so the world as well. May God Almighty help us and bless us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. On this topic of the legacy of Sheikh Ahmad Didat, there is so much to say and I'm, I'm not sure where I should begin. I spent almost all my adult life from teenage in the company of or in the shadow of Ahmad Didat. We shared times when we were students and we used to visit him at As Salam. And the hospitality and kindness that he extended to all of us are memories that we can reflect on and which continues to inspire us. This morning as I was reflecting on what I should say, a fax came through to me from a sister in which she thanks Sheikh Ahmad Didat for what has happened to her. And I would like you to just read this now with me because it's one of the most inspiring things that I have 
come across in the many things that have been read and said about him. This comes from the heart of a sister who found Islam. So share this with me while we reflect on and the glimpses in the life of Ahmad Didak. This came on my desk this morning and I was simply fascinated that and it was coincidental and I thought I should share it with you before I start talking about some of the things that I remember, glimpses in the life of Muha uh, Sheikh Ahmad Didat. The sister, whose real, her first name was Tamara Ann Mudli, and she's now Tasmira Muhammad, writes this thank you note to Sheikh Ahmad Didat, in which she says, I wish I could express the feeling in my heart. I wish I knew where to start, but the gratitude I feel transcends all speech and the reward I should give you is beyond my reach. You've rescued me from the cold, dark sea, and for the first time I feel the sun's warm rays on me. I feel life entering my once dead soul. You've given me Islam, which has made me whole. Thank you for the Quran, the last revelation, and a huge brotherhood, Allah's chosen nation. Thank you for reaching out to people who are lost, whose blindness and ignorance their very souls will cost. May Allah reward you for all that you've done. May Allah bless the work you've unselfishly begun. Thank you once again for the truth of Islam. For at last, my raging sea is peaceful and calm. <laughs> Those of us who knew Ahmad Didat knew of his struggle, knew of his sacrifice, and knew of the time when his wife had to make mitai and sell it so that they could make ends meet, where he was selling sheep and goat so that they could make ends meet. He left his job as a master salesman. He used to work for Victoria Furniture Mart first as a truck driver and later on he had the agency. And this world-class salesman left that to enter the field of Dawa. And from the moment he entered, it was nothing but sacrifice and sacrifice and sacrifice. For almost all his life, it was a sacrifice. Don't look at this building and what came later. For most of his life, it was a sacrifice, trying to make ends meet. I remember the times when his partner and the other side of the coin of IPCI, the late Gulam Hussein Vanka, a truly remarkable and great person on whose life we also need to reflect, didn't have enough money to pay rent for their flat. So it was a life of sacrifice, a life in which he paid with his all. There was nothing that he could do that was not enough for the deen. And on reflecting on his life, what comes out is a, is a person who was strong and powerful, unwavering in his commitment, who stood like a colossus, and when you think about the people that stood up and opposed him, believe me that the Christian priest feared and disliked him as much as the Sheikh and the Alim did. Think about it. As much as the Sheikhs and the Alims disliked and feared him, so did the priest and the pastors and the bishops. How could it be? that ulama would fear and, 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 and oppose him as much if not more than the, than the priests and the pastors. Something to, for us to think about and to reflect. At any one time, while we look at all the wonderful things that he has created, at any one time he was fighting people and stood firm against people as close to him as you can ever imagine. I was 10 years old when I went to the city hall for the first time to listen to him. And before the lecture, 
Sheikh Ahmad Didat's father gets up. Those of you who may remember this will know what I'm talking about. He gets up in front of thousands of people and he berates his son. And he makes him feel that he has been a disobedient son. And in front of all these thousands of people, you would think that if your father got up and said all that about you, you would wish the ground opened and you would be swallowed up. What was his father's concern? Don't fight with the Christians. They are Ahlul Kitab. This is not the way for us. And many things like that. But his father was wrong. Because in the time that we are talking about, there was a worldwide anti-Muslim campaign. It was an aggression against Islam. He grew up and most of us grew up at a time when the Western world called our religion false, called our prophet false, called the Quran false and condemned us to hell saying that only the blood of Christ will save you. So this was an aggression. It was an act of war and it wasn't local. It was international. He met that aggression in the way that Quran tells us that when they fight, you fight them back until there is peace. So in all the arguments that were presented about not fighting with them, about accommodating them, about adopting a peaceful attitude, in that time, when they were telling you that your religion is false, your prophet is false and your Quran is false, how could you regard that as a friendly gesture on the part of people? So Ahmad did that quite rightly met an aggression with an aggression. And in the time that we're talking about, he was probably misunderstood for many reasons. At any one time, it was his father. It was his brother Abdullah, and I wish he was sitting here so that I could tell him in front of his face, with a group called the Al Mujaddid. It was the Ulema, and it was Shuyukh in the Cape. It was Makki, and it was Pirbai. And it was a lot of other Muslims, business people especially, who didn't want to rock the boat. All of them, all together, opposing Ahmad Didat. Leave the Christians one side. All of these people, all at one time, opposing Ahmad Didat. What a man that he could stand up for what he believed. Face all of this. And fight and fight and fight. So the first thing that I remember about Ahmad Didat is that he was a fighter. He was a man who was committed to the jihad for Islam in the best way that he saw it. There's a rhetorical question that I want to ask you. I'm jumping from place to place, but I'm just going to reflect on these things with you because there's so much to talk about. When you go to the Arab world, whether it's the clerk in the hotel, the sweeper on the street, the cook in the hotel, the airline pilot or the president of the country, as soon as you say South Africa, they'll say Ahmad Didat. Do you know Ahmad Didat? And you ask yourself, well, how did this man touch them and why did he touch them? Because they didn't have a Christian problem. They don't have a Christian problem in the Arab world. Although they are Coptic Christians in Egypt and a few in Syria and Lebanon and Jordan, but there was no Christian problem. But almost without exception, from Morocco to Syria, if you mentioned South Africa, they would ask you, Ahmad did that. How did this man touch all these people? And why did he touch all of these people? I don't really know the answer. But I need you to reflect on it. What was it about him? He wasn't fighting the Christians in the Arab world. But he was certainly a person that they recognized, for whatever reason, as their champion probably more well known than any other Muslim in the world. Commonly known by almost all of the Arab people. And yet they have no Christian problem. So it's a question that we need to ask and we need to find out why and we need to really understand the impact that he has made on their lives. Well, the, the way I see it is that 
and this is a thing that we all need to reflect on, that he touched the lives of all those millions and millions of, of Arabs is because they are so oppressed. They have no freedom. There is no such thing as this organization in any Arab country. You will not believe it that you cannot have such a gathering in any Arab country. There are no Islamic organizations in any Arab country. It's outlawed, it's banned. And they see these things as being masterminded by people from the outside, neo-colonialism, those that want to keep the military dictators and the reactionary monarchies in power, those that continue to dominate their lives through the proxies that they have. And here Ahmad Didat goes to the capitals of the Western world. He goes to London and Paris and New York, stands up and challenges the Western arrogance, challenges, and challenges them and humiliates them, challenges them and defeats them, challenges their arrogance and destroys the foundation of their civilization. And that is what they saw as a person, a modern-day Salahuddin born, raising the flag of Islam in the capitals of the, of the Western world. And that is what they, I think, identified with, that here is a Muslim who has the courage to go out and to present the truth of Islam to this world, to the arrogant West. Because of their oppression, because they have no freedom, they identified with him as a symbol of their freedom. There may be other views on this, but it's something worth thinking about. In looking at the glimpses in the life of Ahmad Didat, I would like you to just for one minute focus on where he came from, what was the environment in which he grew. Where this word dawah was never heard. I have yet to hear Olema speak from the member about dawah. The responsibility when you claim that al ulema warathatul anbiya, I'm not here to criticize the ulema, you're saying that you are the true inheritors of the, of, the, of, the, of the prophets, then the first function of the prophet was dawah. And you never heard it. You still don't hear it. At a time when this word was not known to us, at a time when it was something that was foreign, Ahmad Didat and those that were around him took up this, uh, this challenge of dawah and presenting Islam to the people. So we should understand the circumstance. Today we have so many organizations that are doing the work. But at that time, there was, there was just no atmosphere. The environment was not conducive to dawah. Because it was a stranger to us. It was unknown to us. And as a consequence, what they gave to the dawah, they gave almost as if they were doing the person who came there as a beggar, they were giving him some crumbs. There was no commitment to the dawah. So not only was there opposition from the ulema, opposition from all those who felt that we shouldn't rock the boat, that we shouldn't attack the Christians, there was also a paucity of funds. He had to go from door to door collecting so little. If there was, if somebody had a hundred rands to give a year in zakat or whatever, 95 rand would be committed to everything else and the five rand may be committed to dawah. And from that five rand, Pirbai wanted his share, Makki wanted his share, Didat wanted his share. So they were all the time at each other's throats trying to get the biggest share of the smallest crumb. And that is the circumstances in which Ahmad Didat was growing up. But just reflecting a little bit more, just be, uh, beyond that a little bit, in which environment and what was there at the time of Ahmad Didat. But I want to talk to you about 1942, when as a young man in his early 20s, he gave his first lecture on the life of the Prophet Muhammad at Avalon Cinema as a young man, 21 or something like that, and he gave his talk on the life of the Prophet. 
At that time, he hadn't quite confronted the Christians. He hadn't quite met their challenges. But his love for the Prophet made him go out into a cinema to deliver a talk. A young man. He paid for their pamphlet himself. He advertised himself. And he called the late A.I. Kaji to chair that session. Why am I saying this? Because had the Christians not been there, Ahmad Didad will still have been there. He was a fighter. He was a person who was ready to commit himself and to do the work of Dawah. So if the Christian problem was not there, he was still a fighter for Islam. And when I looked at why, and I asked people that knew him why he selected the topic of the life of the Prophet, then I learned about his father. His father belonged loosely to a group known as Ashika Rasul, translation of which means the lovers of the Prophet. When I think about those who claim that they love the Prophet today, I think about his father. If you didn't say that you were an Ashika Rasul, the guy would probably take out his dagger and kill you. They felt so strongly about you being an Ashika Rasul, the lover of the Prophet. This is the loose term in which Ahmad Didat's father was committed to as an Ashika Rasul. And Ahmad Didat grew up in the shadow of that philosophy of Ashika Rasul. We are trying to write something on the life of the Prof of, of Ahmad Didat and in asking people what they knew about Ahmad Didat and his early life, I spoke to Fatima Amir and she told me that Ahmad Didat's father was a close friend of her father and a regular visitor to their home. And when Ismail Mir, when they were just newly married and Ismail Mir went to prison for the first time, for, for those of you who don't know Ismail Mir, he's one of the colleagues of um, uh, our president, uh, ex-president Mandela, very close colleague, one of the original f authors and founders of the uh, charter, he wrote it in his own handwriting, he tells me. So when he went to prison for the first time, Ahmad Didat's father went to console her and to give her support and told her that if we convert these people, then all the problems will be solved. My point in this is that Ahmad Didat grew up in an atmosphere where the, word, where the words of Quran, of the Prophet and of Dawah was there. It existed and it was discussed. So Ahmad Didat grew up in a home where these ideas were, were discussed at home. Among the people that affected his life were people that most of us don't know. One of the first was Mulan Abdul Alim Siddiqui, the father-in-law of the late Fazlur Rahman Ansari, Istiaq Hussein Qureshi, and a strange person who came to, to, to our shores by the name of Joseph Perdu. He was a Baha'i and he used to give classes on Sunday at the Pine Street Madrasa. A lot of the Muslims who were searching used to attend those classes on the Quran. There was such a a lack of information, of understanding of the Quran. It was not there. You ought to understand that at the time of, the, of, of, of Ahmad Didat's youth, these things were not there. So he had to find, they had to find people like Joseph Perdu, who was a Baha'i, to tell them something about the Quran, and who was the first, one of the first teachers of the Quran for them. So, My point in this is that how little there was at that time of Ahmad Didat when he was growing up that they had to find inspiration and knowledge from somebody who was from a borrowed faith. And when you see his passion for the Quran subsequently, you find that he was able to translate that early years of learning and to say that for the Muslims of the world, they need to have the Quran and they need to understand the Quran. And I think that more than any other person, 
in this century, he has been passionately promoting and distributing the English translation of the Quran. So part of his legacy is that yes, he was concerned about the Christian debates that he had. I'm not reflecting on that too much because you know about it already, but we'll come to it in a minute. But that he was passionate about the Quran and he did so much to present the Quran to the world, especially the English translation of the Quran. On reflection and looking at the glimpses in his life, when we were growing up, it was a real problem dealing with the Africana. It was not difficult for him to, to take you off the road or to get hold of you in some corner and slap you or to insult you or to call you kufi, kuli or, or whatever, all those terms. It was very normal for him to do that, to abuse you, to humiliate you. That was the atmosphere in which we grew up. The abuse of the Africana against people and white people generally. And here we find Ahmad Didat at a time when people are afraid to even talk to these people. Standing up on the major platforms, confronting them. Not afraid to stand up to them. And believe me, it was an exhilarating experience for all of us that used to attend these his lectures to stand up and to see the white man being defeated in an atmosphere of apartheid in a time when when he was king and you were nothing Ahmad did that stood up like a colossus and he fought for Islam he presented Islam he humiliated them and we all clapped and said Allahu Akbar these were times when it will be difficult for you to understand what it meant to young people living in apartheid to have somebody like Ahmad Didat stand up to these people. And in standing up to them, he had to test his skill with the best of them. And as you know, they all go through Bible colleges, they all go through institutions of higher learning. They are truly educated people. And one of the things that I had in my notes to tell you is that he was a self-taught man, and you all know that. He didn't have a formal education. He, he was a self-taught man, but he stood up and challenged those who, had, who were professors of theology, bishops, and all kinds of people, highly educated people. And he was able to meet them intellectually, and meet them in a way that made them think and reflect about their own faith. One of his greatest legacies is that the Christian world will never be the same again. Every Bible college, every theological seminary in the world has a section devoted to Ahmad Didat. It has become compulsory reading and compulsory viewing. To graduate from those colleges, you have to study Ahmad Didat. And the debate that he started off with, and this is his true legacy, they started off calling your religion false, your Quran false, your prophet false. They don't do that anymore. You won't see a Christian these days calling your religion false or your Quran false. And that is a remarkable achievement. Because you've got to understand that they came knocking on our doors. It was in our history textbooks. It was on the radio and in newspapers and in magazines that about your religion being false, your Quran being false. But today you don't hear it anymore. Now they have adopted a different approach. Now they are beginning to understand that there is something else in Islam which is beyond their claims of its being false. So they begin to research and find things that they can deal with and the th things that they can challenge you with. But it's a whole new ball game. What is important is that the Christian world is beginning to think and every honest scholar in Christian theology is beginning to say that the questions that Ahmad Didat has raised are questions that need to be answered. And to answer them 
means that they are in trouble. Because the answers to those questions will lead them to Islam. For the King Faisal Prize. The people that received the nomination asked us a few questions. For example, he is not the leader of a great Islamic movement. He has not converted thousands of people. We don't know him as a great scholar, as an author. What, imp what is the purpose? What is the impact? We know that he is popular, but why should he be awarded the King Faisal Prize? And the answer is there in his citation, that he confronted and defeated the worldwide Christian missionary aggression against Islam. On the one hand, and he raised the morale of the Muslims on the other hand. The twin things, to meet that aggression and to defeat that aggression and in the process raise the morale of the Muslims. This was his, his major contribution and this is what the citation for his prize said. And that he was absolutely honest. It's not a reflection of other things or other people that were around. I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about the person that I knew. And if we look at the end of his life and where he started, you find that the fact that we are here today, the fact that so many millions of people all over the world are inspired by him, the fact that so much has happened around him and because of him is nothing but a reflection of his legacy. The time is, is short and we have a lot to say. What I would ask you to do, please, those of you who have any things on the life of Ahmad Didat, to please help us to compile something on his life so that we can present it to people all over the world. We started the center in 1958 with three pounds and five shillings. And Alhamdulillah, from that little beginning, we have grown. This whole area with hundreds of little dwellings is called Adams Mission Station. And about 50 years ago, I worked in a shop close by here. And across the valley from the shop, is what is called Adams Mission Station, Adams College. And students from this college used to come along and uh, those who were trainee missionaries, they were harassing me and the other employees, Muslim employees of the shop, telling us so many things about Islam and about the Prophet of Islam, about which I had no knowledge. Now, these missionaries, you know, they were making life miserable for us from this college. They were getting training there as to how to deal with the Muslims. And as they came to do the shopping here, they asked us questions. Criticism, actually. He says, you know, Muhammad has so many wives. I knew nothing about that. He says, you know, Muhammad spread his religion at the point of the sword. I knew nothing about that. He says, you know, he copied his book from the Jews and the Christians. I knew nothing about that. So what was I as a Muslim to do? You fight back, but without knowledge you can't fight back. Run away and jobs are very difficult to find those days. So I had a natural urge for reading. And one Sunday morning, going into my boss's warehouse, go down, I was rummaging through a pile of old newspapers, looking for some better reading material than newspapers to read. And as I was looking for such a material, I came across a worm-eaten book. This book, we have renewed the cover, but a worm-eaten book. And when I picked it up, when I picked it up, I started to sneeze because it was all full of mildew. And I read the title of the book. It said, Izharul Haq. Spelled out in Latin script, I said, H-A-R-U-L-H-A-K-K, -K -K, Izharul Haq. Now, to me, that sounded Arabic, Izharul Haq. 
it sounds like Arabic. So I didn't know what it meant. I see here at the bottom it says the truth revealed. This was a very old publication printed in 1915 in India. Two years older than myself. I was born in 18. This is three years older than myself. Now this book actually changed my life. Had it not been that I came across this book, I would not have been doing what I'm doing today. That is talking to people about religion on a comparative basis. This is how it all started here in this area 50 years ago. <laughs> Islamic Propagation Center International came into being. As soon as I left school, I started working in a country shop, just about 25 miles outside the city, selling sugar and salt, flour, rice across the counter. Across the valley from the shop, there was a Christian mission, a university where they were training missionaries. And these training missionaries, whatever they learned, they came to practice on the Muslims in the shop. We were ready customers for them. We were the only Muslims around that place, and they would come to us telling us that, you know, Muhammad had so many wives. I knew nothing about that. They would tell us that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he spread his religion at the point of the sword, meaning he forced people to accept Islam. I knew nothing about that. He said Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he copied the Quran from the Jews and the Christians, meaning he plagiarized, he stole. I knew nothing about that. And all the other staff in the shop, we were all in the same level. The only thing we knew about Islam was that we read the Shahada which made us Muslims. What the Shahada meant, when we said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, to us it was like a magic formula. If you can say it, you are a Muslim. If you can't say it, you are not a Muslim. What to do? They made life miserable. The missionaries made life miserable for me and the other staff. I felt like leaving the job and running away. But jobs were very difficult to get. What to do? Allah came to the rescue. I came across a worm-eaten book, a worm-eaten book, in my boss's warehouse, his go-down. The title of the book was Izharul Haq, meaning the truth revealed. And this book title intrigued me because it sounded like Arabic, but it was written in Latin script, in English. I Z H A R U L H A Q Q Izharul Haq. And I ruminated the words in my mind, Izharul Haq, Izharul Haq, what is Izharul Haq? Seeing in brackets, in smaller types, the truth revealed. I now connected that most probably Izharul Haq means the truth revealed. And I read this book. This book was about the Christian missionary attack on India, my motherland. 
that when the British conquered India, they realized that at any time anybody will give them trouble, it will be the Muslims. Because power, rule, dominion was wrenched out of their hands. And once they have tasted power, they will aspire for it once more again. And the Muslims were a militant people in contrast to the Hindus, who were at that time, they were as docile as the cows that they were worshipping. So there was no fear from that quarter. So the British felt that if they can convert the Muslims, a substantial number of them, they can rule India for a thousand years. And they started pouring in the missionaries like frogs in the rainy season into India, wanting to convert our people. I'm reading these, this in this book and about the debates that took place. Now those debates were of great interest to me because this is actually now I'm under pressure from the Christians and it's giving me material. It's arming me. As the debates that took place, the same type of arguments if I can use, I will be in a better position to defend myself and Islam. So whatever I learned in the book, I started practicing on the students now. And I made appointments with them to go to their homes on Sundays, after church, the church, and talking to them, talking to them. And I talked myself into talking until I came to Durban, reside in Durban. I found a job in Durban. And in Durban, around the 50s, an opening took place. This is also Allah's Musabibul Asbab. We had a very charismatic speaker coming from overseas. And this speaker, very unusual, for a Sunday morning, he used to get two to two, three hundred people every Sunday morning. And the crowd was increasing continuously. And I used to attend this talk of his, very fascinating. At the end of the talk, question and answers, and when everything was over, after a few months, a revert to Islam, an Englishman who had become Muslim, by the name of Mr. Fairfax. This Mr. Fairfax, he suggested, this look, any of you, if you are interested, I am prepared to teach you people comparative religion. But he called it Bible class. So I will teach you the Bible, how to use the Bible in propagating Islam. So he said, very good. So uh, out of these two to three hundred audience every Sunday morning that this other gentleman drew, about 15 to 20 opted to remain for a second injection. And this Mr. Fairfax began teaching us that look in the book of Daniels, there are certain prophecies and how to use those prophecies. In the book of Deuteronomy, in the Bible, there are certain prophecies regarding the coming of our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how we can exploit them, how we can expound them. So this thing carried on for a few more weeks or a couple of months and then Mr. Fairfax was absent. And I could see the disappointment on the faces of these young people. We were all young then, uh, uh, 15 to 20 of us. We were looking at each other's faces, disappointed, and we break up. The following Sunday again, we look at each other's faces. Where is Mr. Fairfax? No news. And we break up. The third Sunday, I suggested to them, to the, those people who were enthusiastic about having a, a second inning, I said, look, if you like, I can carry on where Mr. Fairfax left off. Because I had the knowledge, but I was sitting in to give this person my moral support. Myself and my secretary, who has just passed away, Mr. G. H. Chief Anchor. Now, we were both knowledgeable as far as the Bible was concerned. But we would give them our moral support, we said, we sit there and with the rest. Now I said, look, if you like, I will give you, I will carry on from where Mr. Fairfax left off. And if you get bored, tired, fed up, just yawn. And there will be notice enough for me to stop. And for three years, I continued talking to them. And I discovered now that that was my best way of learning. Because there is no better way to learn than to teach. As our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, بَلِّغُ أَنِّي وَلَوْ آيَا Deliver the message regarding me, even if it is one verse. That's a secret. If you have one verse, and if you share, and you share, and you share, then Allah fills you up with more. I didn't know that then, but I can now realize what was happening. Teaching them, teaching them. Then I had some visitors, visitors, visitors to come along. There were some visitors coming from Johannesburg, and they stayed in for my class. 
and they felt that they can exploit my talents. So they said, look, we are having a birthday celebration of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi in the city hall of Johannesburg and we would like you to come and speak to us. So I said, I'm a working class man, I can't afford these trips, but if you give me an A ticket, I will come. So they gave me an A return A ticket and for the first time in my life, I traveled by A to read Johannesburg and deliver the lecture. Now that gave me an idea. That if I can lecture in the city hall of Johannesburg, what is wrong with the city hall of Durban? So, we organized a lecture here in the city hall of Durban. And it, it was in 1958, December 1958. As a result of that, two Caucasians, white people, Europeans, they started visiting our offices in Madras Arcade. And subsequently, a con con Twice, a certain type of conversion took place that we converted to those two white gentlemen who were coming to my office, we converted them in the West Street Mosque here in Durban. And then another two, within a week, an Indian and, and, and uh, a European again in the Juma Masjid, Durban. So there was somebody watching. Allah watches all times. But there was somebody else who was witnessing uh, our work. An elderly gentleman by the name of Haji S.I. Kadwa. So after the second conversion of people in the Juma Masjid, the man, while he's tying his shoelaces, I'm also on the same bench tying my shoelaces, he's telling me that he had observed my work, what I had been doing, and he likes it very much. And he said, look, I got 75 acres of land at a place called Brahma in Natal about 55 miles outside Durban, and I'm prepared to give it to you. So I said, I accept. He said, no, not so fast. You must first have a look at the place. I said, what is there to look? So he said, no, no, you must first have a look. I was thinking that if there are 50 acres of rocks, I'll still have 25 acres of good land. If there are 25 acres of rocks, I'll have 50 acres of good land. And Natal is a garden colony. This colony is called a garden colony with all this greenery and beauty and natural uh, uh, qualities about it. So he said, no, you must have a look. So I, with the, our trustees, we, I went down and I saw the land and I accepted it and I started establishing an institution called As Salam, where I could train Muslim missionaries. It is functioning at the moment. <laughs> على الساحل الجنوبي لإقليم ناتال قرب قرية بريمر يقع معهر السلام ومؤسسة السلام وهو يبعد عن مدينة ديربن بحوالي 90 كيلو متر تقطعها السيارة في حوالي ساعة من مدينة ديربن حتى موقع المؤسسة أقيمت مؤسسة السلام على مساحة خمسة وسبعين فدانا قدمت منحة من عائلة قدوة التي تسكن قرية بريمر لخدمة أغراض التعليم الإسلامي شهدت هذه المنطقة اللبنات الأولى لتأسيس هذه المؤسسة وتضم المؤسسة مسجدا ومدرسة ابتدائية ومعهدا لتدريب وتعليم وتربية الدعاة المسلمين من بين الأفارقة بالإضافة إلى عيادة طبية وملحقات رياضية وترويحية أخرى والهدف من المعهد هو تربية الدعاء الذين يعملون على نشر الإسلام في جنوب أفريقيا وهم يلتحقون بالمعهد ويعيشون هناك حياة إسلامية كاملة أما المدرسة الابتدائية فإنها تخدم المجتمع المحلي وهي مدرسة إسلامية يدرس بها الأطفال الأفارقة بهدف جذب السكان الأصليين إلى الإسلام ولخدمة البيئة المحلية 
والسكان الأفريقيين أقيمت عيادة طبية يرعاها ويديرها الأطباء المسلمون ومن خلال المدرسة الابتدائية والعيادة الطبية يتعرف الأفارقة على الإسلام إن مؤسسة السلام هي المؤسسة الإسلامية الوحيدة في جنوب أفريقيا كلها وهي خطوة رائدة وعملية تحتاج إلى الدعم والاستمرار لأهميتها في نشر الدعوة الإسلامية في جنوب القارة الأفريقية started the center in 1958 with three pounds and five shillings and alhamdulillah from that little beginning we have grown we have grown as you we have noticed that this building here in which we are situated we purchased this and we have freed it from all debt we have purchased another building which will now accommodate an auditorium and there are about numerous shops to bring us income and the work is progressing so we have been doing a certain type of work in that we were using the Juma Masjid Durban for attracting visitors. So we started advertising the Juma Masjid Durban in the Durban Corporation brochure they give out to visitors, tourists, we saying that visit the largest mosque in the southern hemisphere for a free guided tour phone 27054 that was a very old old number and people used to phone and they used to come because generally to the tourist they didn't know the difference between a mosque and a temple to them now these are synonymous terms so they came and we explained we explained to them what goes on we gave them free literature and this was one of our major works that we were doing giving out literature and explaining islam and holding lecture meetings throughout the country on different topics where we can enthuse the Muslim with regards to propagation. So strengthen them against the Christian missionary activity and put them in a, in a position that they can talk back and explain Islam. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. My name is Abdul Rahman. I mainly take tourists to the mosque on mosque guide tours and we get people from all ethnic groups, mainly white people, and I speak to them about Islam. I also do conversions or reversions to Islam, and I also answer correspondence from all over the world. The sun rises and sun sets according to God's law or nature's law. Human beings are the only creation we tell ourselves we know better. We do not submit to God's commandments or his law as a result of which we made a mess out of this whole world. Right. This is why if you, if you observe a Muslim, he seemed to do things that you will find was done by Jesus, Moses and the prophets of God in the Bible and the Jewish scriptures. For instance, I met you with the greeting words of peace, assalamu alaikum. Every prophet of God met people by saying peace be unto you. I'll prove it. In the Bible, in the book of John, chapter 20, 21 and 22, Jesus is set to meet people by saying peace be with you. In the book of the Kings, David and Solomon meets people by saying peace be with you. Jesus in the New Testament tells his disciple, he says, when you enter a house, say peace be to the house. He spoke Aramaic and he said, Shalom Alaikum. We Muslims are the only one till today who meet people by saying peace be unto you. There's also a very good common sense reason for saying peace be unto you. For instance, if I said good morning or good afternoon to you, it would just mean the good morning or the good afternoon. When I say peace be unto you and you are depressed, it means peace come over to you. And it means peace in the morning, the afternoon and the night. And also I am imparting the peace of the knowledge or the teachings of God or Islam to all human beings I meet. Can you see it's a more complete and wholesome meeting, has a more complete meaning. Also, we, the first thing we did is we took off our shoes. Why? The prophets of God took off their shoes. For instance, in the Bible, the book of Exodus chapter 3, verse 5, the book of Acts chapter 7, verse 33, you find that God commands the holy prophet Moses at Mount Sinai. He says to Moses, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. 
God commands the holy prophet Moses at Mount Sinai to remove his shoes in the presence of the Almighty God. Jesus says, I come not to destroy the law of Moses, but to fulfill it. That means that he came to fulfill the laws of Moses. If Moses, Moses took off his shoes, he must have taken his shoes off when he prayed too. The common sense reason for taking off our shoes when we attend our praises of worship or pray is as follows. The dirtiest part of your shoe, of your body, is the underneath of your shoes. With it, you go to the toilet. With it, you trample over the feces of animals. God is pure and clean. If the imperfect human being wishes to perfect himself, he must be clean. Right? Muslims also wash themselves before they pray. The prophets of God wash themselves before they pray. If you look in the Bible, you find in the book of Exodus, chapter 40, 31, 32, you see that Moses and Aaron are set to wash their hands and feet thereat. They wash as the Lord commanded Moses before they enter the tent of the congregation. So, washing ourselves before prayer serves threefold purpose. It is what the prophets of God did. It's a good hygienic practice. Third reason, and most significant, it serves a mental preparation for prayer, a psychological purpose. For at the time when we wash ourselves before the prayer, we have the following prayer in mind. God, make us of those who are the purified and those who repent for their sins. So, we started with advertising the Quran in our local New Sunday newspapers, one called the Sunday Tribune. We advertise Quranic verses under the heading, The Quran Speaks a message from the Quran and giving our name and address that further inquiries can be made and for, for free literature they can write. And then the same thing we started doing for the African people in the Zulu language newspaper called Ilangala Se Natal, mean the son of Natal, in which we had Ikuran Yakuluma, which means what the Quran says. And again, the same technique, verses from the Quran translated into Zulu and offering people free information and, and, and uh, literature. Then we have also had other ideas like advertising Islam in a most unobtrusive manner. We don't offend people like you'll see on buildings here. These signs promoting the reading of Kalam Allah, the word of God, are absolutely unique in the Muslim world. إن الإعلان عن الإسلام والقرآن الكريم بهذه الطريقة قد يصدم الكثيرين منا نحن المسلمين لأننا لم نألف مثل هذا الأسلوب من قبل ولكن هذه الظاهرة هي واقع سجلته عدسات التلفزيون في شوارع مدينة ديربا بجنوب أفريقيا وقد تكون له دواعيه ومبرراته المحلية في جنوب أفريقيا On buildings you'll find the sign saying, read Al-Quran, the last testament. Read Al-Quran, the last testament. During the day, the sign is there, and at night, it flashes, you know, the color. So in other words, attracting people's attention. Read Al-Quran, the last testament. Now, most especially in the South African context, it is mildly provocative. Because this is, as I said, an ocean of Christianity. And in this ocean of Christianity, they know the Old Testament and they know the New Testament. So when you are speaking about the Last Testament, it becomes as a shock. So what do you mean Last Testament? So, inquisitiveness, which is to us attracting them, wanting to know, where can we get the Quran? What is this Quran? So we are achieving this by advertising these on top of buildings. We have a dozen different types of literature, all on comparative basis. And we are publishing these literature now 100,000 at a time. We have a book called What the Bible Says About Muhammad. That book, we have done more than 300,000. Then we have another book, Is the Bible God's Word? We have done more than 260,000. And all, crucifixion or crucifixion, Christ in Islam, how Islam solves the racial problem, the Muslim at prayer, and on and on, we are printing these booklets 100,000 at a time for absolutely free distribution. We don't charge anybody. Only the Quran we have to sell. If people buy, buy they can buy if they can't afford they must write and tell us why we should give them for nothing and we do give provide for them
هذه المخضعة هي ملك للمركز الدولي للدعوة الإسلامية وهي تقوم بطباعة كل ما يتعلق بالنشرات والكتيبات التي تخص المركز بالإضافة إلى المطبوعات والدفاتر والنماذج التي يحتاجها المركز في نشاطه اليومي وتقدم هذه المطبعة خدماتها لمن يرغب من الزبائن لتشكل بذلك دخلا ماليا للمركز الدولي للدعوة الإسلامية We have so far handled this office of mine some 85,000 holy Quran translations Arabic text, translation and commentary which we have been selling and what returns we get gets plowed back into propagation and we have also been giving out these Qurans we have been offering to free, free, free to every school, college, university and public library absolutely free of charge to every mosque and madrasa absolutely free of charge and we have handled so far about 85,000 we have just placed an order now for another 100,000 for helping our brethren all over the world for example, I'm sending 10,000 Qur'ans to our Afro-American brethren in America. I want to help the people in Sri Lanka and in India, Pakistan, in the UK. We want to do this, that the Qur'an is made available, freely available, at a very low price, subsidized cost, or even free. And 100,000 are now, inshallah, under print. We are reproducing videotapes of our lectures, mostly on comparative basis. Like this particular one, it says, Muhammad Sallallahu Wasallam in the Bible in resp response to Swagat. And we have today now, this is tape number 35, but we have 40 different videotapes on Islam. This is a video production department of the Islamic Propagation Center International. Besides me stand the video production rack, housing more than 20 video machines of different makes. It is with the aid of these mechanical machines that we are able to, to, com to, able to produce over 200 copies of videos a week, averaging between 800 to 1,000 copies, depending upon the duration of the lecture of Mr. Didat talks and debates. At times, the duration of the lectures fall between one hour, two hours and three hours. And depending on the duration of these lectures, the tapes vary between 800 to 1,000 cassettes a month. Besides producing cassettes of Mr. Didat, as you can see, tapes of other famous Muslim personalities are also made there. At the moment, as you can view on our monitors, is Yusuf Islam, a prominent scholar who, from the Western world who have finally accepted Islam after realizing the potential of Islam and how it has made his life simple. Besides titles of use of Islam, we have other copies for other people who have accepted Islam as well. We started with one room for videos, you know, mass producing. We installed 10 machines. One room was taken up. Now we need three rooms for doing the job. We have now an editing suite. Now we want to put up another 10 machines because as fast as we are producing these tapes, we can't seem to cope up with it. Bismillah rahman rahim In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Wa qawlihim inna qatal inna qatal al masiha please abnu marima rasulullah And they said in boast that we kill Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the apostle of God. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We at the Islamic Propagation Center make use of the facilities that you see before you to do editing of our tapes. The tapes are first shot by our cameramen on crew and once they have been shot, they are brought here to be edited. Once these tapes are edited, they are taken to our duplication rack where we have made hundreds of copies of this particular tape. We do biblical inserts as well as Quranic inserts. At the moment, we have just released Ahmad Didat and Robert Douglas's debate that was held in 1986. The Quranic inserts as well as the biblical inserts have been completed and they are ready for marketing. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We say it is cruci, F-I-C-T-I-O in fiction. It sounds the same, 
crucifixion or crucifixion. The spelling, this is the difference between the two. That in the Islamic point of view, it is a fiction. Now, when we say that it is a fiction, the Christian brings forth, produces his book of evidence. He says, here, we have a written record by eyewitnesses and new witnesses to the happenings some 2,000 years ago. That Jesus Christ was hanged and killed on the cross some 2,000 years ago. Now, what I'm going to do tonight is, instead of telling you this is what the Muslims say, this is what the Quran says, I said, look, I want to show to you that the Bible that you hold in your hands, whatever version you have, you will find the verses that I'm going to quote and the argument I'm going to induce. The whole world is crying for these tapes because it's something novel to them. It's, it's really a novel thing because they have heard lectures about only addressing Muslims, how to make salat, we must give zakat, we must not drink, we must not gamble, you know, we must be attired Islamically and all that. They have been listening to that continuously for centuries now, for decades. But now comes along something novel in, in a, most especially people in a Western environment, like in the United States or in any other country where Muslims are, where the Christian missionaries are making onslaughts, like in India and in Pakistan and in Bangladesh and in Indonesia, wherever the Muslims are, we find that they are under attack and they don't know how to respond. They don't know how to respond to these Christian missionaries. So our tapes are doing the job. So there is a demand all over the world, so the department is expanding and increasing. Then literature. We need special departments to cater for the amount of correspondence that's coming in. You know, it's what we didn't handle in a year, we're handling in a week now. We're in the old places, old offices. What we didn't do in a year, in a week. There are piles and piles of letters. We have to f discover some new methods of handling them because we can see that they are all now drowning us. My name is Ismail and I am responsible for the receiving of the correspondence that comes into the Islamic Propagation Center. We receive an average of about 100 to 150 letters per day from all countries in the world. The percentage of letters that we receive in the various areas are about 50% from the African states, namely Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, Sierra Leone and surrounding areas. The rest of the letters we receive from countries like the UK, USA, South America, India, Australia. We have even received letters from as far as Siberia and Alaska. The contents of these letters or the requests contained in these let letters vary from literature requests to video requests. The pe uh, people requesting literature also inquire about the activities of the organization and the other facilities that we offer. ولمواجهة أعباء العمل المتزايدة على المركز الدولي للدعوة الإسلامية في مدينة دوربن ومسايرة للتطورات العلمية والتكنولوجية المعاصرة أدخل المركز نظام الكمبيوتر بالإضافة إلى وسائل الاتصالات العصرية. The information that we are entering on the computer is from the letters that we have received from correspondents all over the world. We have two special files. One is our local files, which are stored, lo just stored in, a, in this room. And the other one is Mr. Dizat's files, which are, very, which are special files. Both those files are on computer, and uh, we have approximately 7,000 names on the computer at present. The correspondent that's coming, uh, coming is drowning us. Each and every department who are handling the opening department. They have to find and sort out their letters. Given to different departments, these are orders to be executed. This is just free literature required. These are people asking questions, what to, you know, how to answer the questions. So then these visitors coming along from the masjid, they want to know further about Islam. Then conversion taking place, people come along, they want to be converted to Islam either from Hinduism to Islam or from Christianity to Islam. Generally from Christianity and Hinduism, we get a lot of converts. But now before we convert anybody, I know the old practice was 
that anybody wants to be converted. We said, now you want to become a Muslim? The man says, yes. He said, I read the Shahada. He said, what is that? He said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So he said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. He's a Muslim. And then we said, now look, from today your name is Muhammad. Or if it's a lady, it's a Khadija or Fatima. And you know, you must make Salat. And so on. And so you must fast when Ramadan comes. And we let them go. This is what usually used to happen. From now on, you must wish one another, Assalamu alaikum, and you are a Muslim, or a Muslimah. Now, we have a system that anybody wants to embrace Islam, he or she must at least go through four lectures. So, in these four lectures, what we do is this, that we disabuse their minds about all the prejudices. They have a concept of God. They say there is one God, but the concept is not the Islamic concept. See, they say one God, but they say he's three in one, his Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So we have to disabuse our minds that Jesus is not God. The Holy Ghost is not God. There is only one God. And that God Almighty, we call him Allah. And Muhammad is not our Allah. We have to explain to them what the angels are, what the books of God are, that the Quran is Allah's Kalam. The Bible, as they have got it now, is not preserved. So we have to explain, and Jesus didn't die for anybody's sins, that he's not God, and he was not crucified. To the Hindu, he said he believes in one God. But when you ask him, who is Rama? He says, God. Who is Krishna? He says, God. Who is Buddha? He says, is God. So who is Siva? He says, God. And on and on. He gives you man gods. He gives you women gods. He gives you animal gods. But poor man, he doesn't know. So we have to disabuse his minds, clarify his thoughts. And then if the person accepts all the teachings of Islam, the fundamentals and the requirements of the Sharia, he agrees, then we tell him to have a good bath, the Islamic bath, and come back and we will bring him into Islam. So all these are different, different departments handling. You know, for the Zulu, there's a person handling the Zulu convert. There is a person handling the, uh, the English-speaking convert. So each and every department that we have are so busily occupied we are looking for a way inshallah of smoothing out our what you would say teething troubles because we have grown up suddenly into this huge size we came to this place about a year ago and since then you know the things have snowballed snowballed to such an extent that now with the computer and the fax machines and uh, and the tel telex machines we still can't cope up so we have now exploited the machines these electronic wizards by creating what we call islamic telecoms we have two uh, in Durban at the present moment. One in our own building here, two of our shops, you know, we took them over, shops in the building, and we t changed them into Islamic telecoms. What happens there is that in the window, we have a monitor that at least 16 hours a day, our programs are being played, passes by are being attracted. Then inside, we have seating accommodation that the people can come and sit inside, watch the monitor inside, in comfort, and at 10 o'clock, we give them everybody free tea. And he gives examples from the Holy Bible that there are 10 cases of incest in the Holy Bible. I didn't know that. I knew that in the first book of the Bible, Genesis, there were four cases. Brother Swagat's book, and like this, me, I got the fifth one in the first book. As if this is a textbook on incest to tell you what. what Among our lecture activities, so besides lecturing to people in the masjids, Muslim to Muslims, then guiding visitors to the mosque and delivering lectures in public places on comparative religion, we have gone into a new field of doing munaziras with the Christians. And the advantage of that is that it attracts the maximum number of people and it makes things more interesting. Instead of just mere lecturing, we talk about was Christ crucified? A 1,200 million Christians say yes, a 1,000 million Muslims say no. Where lies the truth? You be the judge. So it attracts people. 
then subjects like is Jesus God? We had a debate uh, in the Royal Albert Hall, London. Uh, the Royal Albert Hall was too small. If the Quran is indeed from God, does it contradict itself in as much as it says, okay. Therefore, Jesus was born, he died, and he rose again. The verse in question is Wassalamu alayya yawma wulidtu wa yawma amutu wa yawma ubasu hayya Which translated means So peace is on me the day that I was born the day that I die and the day that I shall be raised to life again The day that I die it is not the day that I died It's not died, it's in the future Then we have now started training Da'is, people who can go and propagate Islam. Because the Muslims all over the world, where I go and lecture, they seem to have taken a liking to my approach. Because something that was lacking in, that the Muslim didn't know how to approach the non-Muslim, the Jews, the Christians, the Hindus, and I'm showing them how it can be done. To me, it's just a very natural thing to do which Allah Ta'ala gives us a secret in the Holy Quran when he says, Qul, tell them, Ya Ahl al-Kitab, O people of the book, O Jews and Christians, ta'ala, come. Ila kalimatin sawa'im baynana wa baynakum that we come to common terms as between us and you. Let us get on to a common platform. Some understanding us about basics. And then Allah Ta'ala tells us what to talk about. But now we have not been doing that because we don't know how. Allah is telling you on a common platform, talk about this. Allah na'budu illa Allah, wa la nushrika bihi shay'an, wa la yattakhiza ba'duna ba'dan arbaba min dunillah. From the United States, brother, على مدى شهر أبريل ومايو من العام الماضي انتظم هؤلاء الدارسون الذين يتسلمون شهادات تخرجهم الآن انتظموا في دورة تدريبية مكثفة اجتمع فيها عشرون من الدارسين المسلمين من ستة عشر بلدا وهذه الدورة على النحو الذي تمت به وبالدارسين الذين حضروها تعتبر الأولى من نوعها فالدراسة فيها كانت بالإنجليزية بهدف إعداد الدعاة المسلمين الذين يستطيعون العودة إلى بلادهم للدعوة للإسلام ولمواجهة النشاط المعادي للإسلام والنشاط التبشيري المسيحي الذي يجتاح آسيا وأفريقيا في الوقت الراهن ويتكفل بجميع نفقات هذه الدورة وغيرها رجال الأعمال المسلمون من أبناء الجزيرة العربية ولقد تحمسوا لتربية وتكوين عدد من الدعاء على شاكلة الشيخ أحمد ديدات بعد إذاعة النسخة العربية من مناظرة ديدات وسوغرت الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد Dear brothers, we have gathered here today at the tail end of our program which began in April and we have gone through a lot of work, a lot of questioning, a lot of fact-finding and researching. Alhamdulillah, we have found that all of you were enthusiastic and you have the zeal inshallah to spread the word of Islam and to and to dispel whatever is wrong in the world of Islam as far as the thoughts and thinking about Islam is concerned. We have a great job of work to do. You will go back to your homes and your homelands and you will see inshallah that what we have initiated here will carry on and on and on. So therefore, become articulators of Islam. This is why Da'i is one who can open his mouth and who can do something. We don't mind if you can write, keep on writing, but see that you become articulate in what you have learned here. And I have been very happy with the class as a whole, Alhamdulillah, we have had very close cooperation and I myself have learned immensely 
from the experiences of the of others and as there is no finality as far as any knowledge is concerned there is no finality i have been learning we have been learning we will keep on learning from each other and each other's experiences and inshallah we will march along together throughout the world in order to allow the flag of islam to fly high and that will be the day which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he has promised us that, that that day will come and we can be part and parcel and soldiers and warriors in his way and this is the work of the prophets and it has got the reward that prophets deserve and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this opportunity and we must take it and what we are hoping is that we train them in this method of doing da'wah to non-muslims that they in turn they can go back into their own respective countries and share with the people the knowledge that they have gathered here and in sharing they'll get more and create centers of their own because the thing is getting unwieldy is getting so big is getting more or less out of proportion our center here we want centers to be created all over that each and everyone independently can carry on we will give them all the help that we can but independently they can do what we are doing here so this is our aspiration and in that we are prepared to help Muslims all over the world to see that they do propagation work. This is our speciality and we want to share this speciality with the Muslims all over the world. <laughs> My father is watching it right now, he's looking at it. Oh, you mean he does? You, you don't read to him aloud, no? No, he reads himself. Is that so? Yeah, he reads himself. He's reading it himself. That's why I said bring it. He reads. He reads the Saudi Gazette and all. He reads all papers. Sunday papers. I always was reads. under the impression that you have to read for him aloud. No, 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 no. no. He reads everything mm -hmm. himself. So what is? So what do you do? How, how do you do that? I'm holding it uh, at a 90 degree angle to his eyes, and I, I put on his spectacles. So and I'm holding it straight ahead, and I'm looking at his eyes while he reads the paper. Would he when he blinks up means he has read it already? Then I turn the page again. Okay. And say if he wants to go through a certain part of the page again, then he just carries on. I just keep on. I have to hold that whole page as long as he wants me to hold it. It can take 15 minutes, 20 minutes, or whatever. Okay. Right, now you blink, means I must turn it. But the fine prints will still read it for you, Baba. So you just want to have a look at that. The second page I'm showing him now. He's reading the second page. How is your health over the last couple of months? I know I came to see you last when, the, when Dr. Quick was around. Right. My father's health was not good for the last two weeks. My father had an attack of pneumonia. Alhamdulillah, he is in excellent condition today. With the blessings of Allah, maybe Allah gave him another chance so that you may visit him once more. No, it was, I think it's also a very, I think ever since I got to know your father's tapes, I've been really, really inspired. Jazakallah. And it has made me appreciate Islam. You know when Jazakallah. people bath him, right. how do you all actually do that? Because... Oh, you that's know, a mission. Be, uh, I'm not trying to be sarcastic, but I mean with his size. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh, no, that's a mission. Stop that is point. truly a mission, my brother. It is really no joke to bat my father. Bottom line. It's a mission on its own. In other words, my father, number one, is so heavy, you can't get him out of bed. Right. 
So what we do is, the bed is electronically controlled bed, uh -huh. which was uh, donated to us by Prince Sultan bin Salman from Saudi Arabia. Okay. He gave us the bed. Yeah. Okay. The bed goes down flat, 90 degree flat. Then what we do is we pull my father to the extreme edge. For instance, on, on, on the edge on the right hand side, we pull him extreme of the edge of the bed. Yeah. Then we, 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 we cushion him with pillows on his opposite side of the side we pulled. We cushion him with pillows and then we turn him. We right. turn him. Right. We lift him and turn him and we wash this side of the back. Okay. We wash him out here. Right. Then we do the same on the other way round and we cushion him on this side with a pillow. Okay. This side we cushion him and then we turn him again okay. and we wash the other side. And then the front side we wash him on this angle. So Alhamdulillah, it's a mission, but Alhamdulillah, we do it all in, in, in his bed. Okay. Next question. All in his bed? All done in the bed. We can't get him out of bed. Okay. When, for example, like say there's a situation now where there's no visitors. Sometimes we get public holidays, Sunday mornings, all that, you know, where it's quiet. Right. And how does your father pass his time? Wow, that is another, the, 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 the biggest responsibility that we have is not just taking care of my father. He is keeping his mind occupied, right. right? And that is a mission on its own because the mind, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made our mind to wander aimlessly on issues. We become restless. My father's mind, all he was an avid reader of books, number one. Okay. Now here comes a situation totally opposite. He cannot get access to books in that sense of him reading freely. So his mind is now sitting and wandering. So what he does is he watches videotapes of his own personal recordings. <laughs> this is how I did that here. Yeah? 83 years old, taking care of a beloved husband, giving him orange juice to have right now. She's feeding him with orange juice. Oh, is that how she feeds him? Yeah, with a tube going di directly into the stomach. There's a tube going directly into the stomach. Where does the tube fit in? I'll show it to you. In, 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 on the stomach, it's a gastrostomy tube. Right. She's giving him orange juice right now. She tells, she administers four injections a day to my father. She is the lady who baths my father, and she is the lady that my father saw to marry, and he rejected her. <laughs> Don't laugh, ah. Right now, I want to show you as well the tube. How my father just stand up. Right, hold the tube. Hold your two hands. Hold your hands. Hold your hands. Hold your hands. Hold your hands. Right. Go down. Go lower down. Go lower down. Go lower down. Where? Your hand. Let your hand run down. Yeah, yeah. Right. That's the stomach. Yeah. Okay. Now that is a stomach. Okay. Now this is a tube that is going directly into the stomach for feeding okay. my father. Alhamdulillah. That's how so he's fed. So is that he only can take liquids? That's it. That's solids? the only way. No. No, no solid. No, 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 no solids no at all. No solids at all.